welcome to my channel. So today's video is the second video in my solved series. You guys really responded well last week. I was unsure of how you would like these solved cases. Um, all the ones that I'm doing don't necessarily have the best endings, but I feel like there is so much to learn. So to see you guys respond so great to it was the best feeling in the entire world. So I do want to say before I get into this video that this case isn't technically fully closed yet. There is someone that's been charged for the murders and the trial is about to start in less than a week. Um, but I feel confident enough in it to say that this is pretty much solved and all the investigators feel the same way. So I wanted to go ahead and add it. Plus you guys ask for this particular case all the time and it is going huge right now since the trial is about to start and that is the case of the murders of the McStay family. The McStay family it was an extremely just average family, just happy family. The father's name was Joseph, the mother's name was Summer, and then they had two little boys who were four and three years old, Gianni and Joseph Jr. Joseph was a hard-working father. He managed a company that built decorative fountains and waterfalls, and Summer was also a hard-working mother, an amazing mother at that, to her two little boys, and she worked as a realtor. They had just moved into a brand new home in Fallbrook, California, when unfortunately their lives were abruptly ended. February 4th, 2010 at 7.47 p.m., the neighbor's surveillance camera caught something kind of funky going on over at the McStay's house. The camera recorded a strange vehicle leaving the McStay's house, one that did not belong to the McStay family. And this was just the first in a very strange series of events. The house seemed extremely quiet. It seemed like nobody was there. And after a few days of no one really seeing or being able to get in touch with the McStay family, friends and family tried to reach out and see what exactly was going on and none of them got a response. Chase Merritt was a man that worked with Joseph. He partnered with him all the time. He was a welder. He helped build a lot of the waterfalls for the company that Joseph managed. And he became a little bit concerned and said that he had driven out to the home a couple days after the 4th, after they first initially went missing, because he was concerned for their well-being. He didn't really say if he went into the home. I'm sure he tried to knock. I don't know if he said that he just looked to see if the car was in the driveway, but he didn't see anyone. Then on February 15th, Joseph's brother Mike and Chase Merritt decided to drive out to the McStay house to see what was going on. Mike ended up climbing through one of the windows in the house and realized that not a single family member was in the house, but their two family dogs were outside and they had not been fed and they appeared to have been outside for an extended period of time, which led Mike to think that the McStays had not been home since the last time they were seen which was by Chase Merritt on the 4th of February. Police were already made aware by Chase Merritt that the McStay family had not been heard from in a really long time. However, police didn't show up until after Mike had already gone in and checked the house. It was almost 14 days later that police showed up and searched the house and they found absolutely no sign of struggle, no sign of foul play whatsoever. Keep that in mind. But they did think that the McStays left in a very rushed way. There was a carton of raw eggs that was sitting out on the counter that looked like they were about to be used. There was an open banana sitting out on the counter. There were two bowls of popcorn sitting on the couch. Once again, the dogs had just been left outside and they had just moved into this house and just started renovations and it wouldn't be a good time for them to just disappear or go on vacation. Police searched a little bit further and figured out that the McStay family car was actually found on February 8th, just four days after they had initially last been seen. The car had been parked at a strip mall near San Diego right beside the Mexico border sometime on the 8th itself between 5.30 and 7 p.m. And then at 11 p.m. security guards noticed that it had been sitting there for a while and because it was a strip mall and they didn't allow cars to just sit overnight, they had the vehicle towed. This was strange because the car showed up on the 8th and the last time the family was seen at the house was on the 4th. So police had no idea where exactly the car had been from the 4th to the 8th. And if the McStay family had been in the vehicle, why did they abandon it? This is when a ton of theories started sprouting up 
everywhere about this case. People were thinking they had something to do with drug cartels, Mexican drug cartels in particular, because the vehicle was found right beside the Mexican border. And then some people just thought that the McStays fled on their own, that they decided to leave. They just crossed the border into Mexico to never be heard from again. It was completely out of character for them to just vanish like this without saying anything to anyone. So police really did not know where to start. And keep in mind, this isn't just one person vanishing. This is four people, an entire family. Where do you start with that? You know, it's hard to assume that they just walked away on their own because they would hopefully tell someone. And at the same time, it also doesn't seem very likely they were all taken by someone because that's four people that would take a lot of work on someone else's part to do that. So police were just dumbfounded and didn't know where to start. They began looking into their computers and looking into their searches and found out that the McStays had been searching what do children need to travel to Mexico and other things like Spanish classes, how to learn Spanish, things like that, which led them to their very first and one of their largest theories. Police started believing that the McStay family fled to Mexico to start a new life. It made sense to them. They had all of these searches going on in their computer. They left without telling anybody. And then their car was found right beside the Mexican border. So to the police, it really connected a lot of dots and made a lot of sense. So then after no leads panned out in April 2013, police officially said that the McStay family more than likely left to Mexico on their own accord. There had even been sightings in Mexico and not just one or two, there was a good chunk of sightings in Mexico. There were other sightings that happened in other countries, um, but once again, the police just thought this could be them leaving to Mexico to kind of lose the trail in the United States to then jump to another place. So they really thought the McStay family left on their own. But the families did not agree with this theory at all. They did not believe the McStays would have left to go to Mexico because there had been a ton of drug gang violence over there, drug wars. It was extremely, extremely intense at the time of the McStays disappearance. So the family knew there was no way they would subject their children to any sort of violence like that or potential threat. So they did not believe they would have left to Mexico. To top it off, their bank account had over $100,000 in it that had not been touched since they disappeared. If you were fleeing to another country, maybe hop over to another one, you don't leave over $100,000 in your bank account. That could keep you afloat until you were able to start this new identity and start this new life without being found. Summer's sister even said that Summer's passport was expired and had been expired for a decently long time. And she would not have risked not being able to get back into the United States if she went across the border into Mexico. Rumors even started spreading after this that they were in some financial trouble. A former neighbor of theirs said that they were about to be evicted before they got their new home. I mean, there were so many people that seemed to be coming up out of the woodworks, claiming this, claiming that, claiming they knew all these different things. But when police looked further into these financial troubles, I mean, other than the fact that they had over $100,000 in their bank account, they didn't find anything. So that didn't seem to be the problem. The whole case was just so confusing and caught everybody off guard. So then it started really drawing drawing the eyes of amateur sleuths. There were people with really bad intentions, let's just say that. There was one man who ended up writing a book about the entire family and what he thought happened and included all of his theories. However, he was almost using this case and creating these absolutely absurd theories out of it. Like, totally offhand theories about this case and it infuriated not only the family but a ton of people. I saw information that the man who wrote this book was even working with other private investigators and pulling up a ton of personal information on this family. I'm talking like emails, bank receipts, all kinds of records and he totally used this to paint this absolutely awful picture of the family. Um, you know, all families go through struggles. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. My husband's not perfect. You know, you guys aren't perfect. No one's family is perfect. 
but he seemed to really want to turn it into the family having problems. He brought up all kinds of horrific stuff that I won't even mention here. At one point, he even accused Summer of murdering the entire family for her own gain. I mean, he really dug deep into this family and dug deep into the family that was still suffering while looking for so many people that they cared about. Joseph's father, Patrick, even publicly really punched this man in the gut and said that he was just using this case as financial gain for himself and to try to put himself on the map. And that he was using the family's situation and really over sensationalizing this case and making it seem so much more extravagant and insane. The writer of the book then said that all of the money that he earned from it, he wasn't even keeping for himself. He was giving to Texas Equisearch. I don't know how true that is, but it caused a huge amount of issues. A lot of people then bought this book and started thinking horrible things about the family and you have to keep in mind in situations like this when a whole family goes missing, it's just like I said when I was talking about the Trump family. People are quick to jump on bandwagons and when someone is missing, you need to give them the benefit of the doubt until some actual proof comes forward that proves otherwise because so many people ended up jumping on this bandwagon and tearing this family apart. Imagine if four members of your family went missing and then someone came out and created all these insane accusations that ended up hindering the case. I mean, it's disgusting. Like, it's absolutely disgusting. And through all of this, theories just kept mounting up. People just kept saying that they knew things. There were other theories that it was an ex-boyfriend of Summers who had a serious obsession with her based on a bunch of emails. I mean, they thought he had something to do with it. He had this huge, long criminal history. And then they started focusing on Chase Merritt, the last person that saw any member of the family and the first person that ever alerted anyone that the family was missing. As I said, the surveillance footage had caught a strange vehicle leaving at 747 on February the 4th. But a little bit after eight, so only shortly afterwards, a phone call was made from Joseph McStay's phone to Chase Merritt. And this phone call went unanswered. When Chase was asked about it, he claimed that he was watching a movie with his girlfriend, thought it was just a follow-up on their meeting that they had that day, and totally pushed it aside as nothing of importance. Chase Merritt did not have a very good track record. He had previous felony convictions of burglary and stolen property, and his most recent one was in 2001. He had stolen $32,000 in drilling and welding equipment from a company, and someone who even knew him stated to a reporter that police really needed to look more into Chase Merritt and anyone that Chase was acquainted with at that time which immediately set off red flags for a lot of people. In 2013, Merritt finally admitted that he had been with Joseph for over an hour that day. It was known at this point that he was the last one to see them, but there weren't a lot of details as to what exactly happened. They had met for lunch to discuss a business deal. As I stated before, Joseph was the manager of a company that created these waterfalls and Merritt was someone who made them. Um, I'm pretty sure he was specifically a welder. It was apparently some really huge opportunity to build an extravagant, extravagant waterfall for someone overseas. Um, they did sell these online and it was really taking off. It was huge for them. Um, and that is apparently, according to Chase, what they had gone to lunch to talk about that day. Everyone immediately thought that he was absolutely the one who did it, and it started really irritating him, and his brother was even questioned. His brother got really angry. He said that he had absolutely no more information to offer when it came to the disappearance, and then something really huge happened. November 11th, 2013, a motorcyclist uncovered two very shallow graves containing the remains of four people in the death starts outside of Victorville, northeast of Los Angeles. Two days later, the remains were positively identified as Joseph and Summer McStay and their two young, young children. The deaths were ruled a homicide by San Bernardino police. They believe the family had died of blunt force trauma and they think it happened inside the home. Joseph had a cut off extension cord that had been tied around his neck 
and Summer had paint splatters, the same exact paint color that was being used in their renovations all over her. And they also found a three pound sledgehammer inside the graves, which they believed to be the murder weapon. And it was also smeared with the same paint. 2014, Merritt then went on to say that he was going to write a book about the family. So a year after they were found murdered, this man was going to write a book on them. And when I tell you what he wanted the book to be about, you are going to be sick to your stomach. He said that Summer had anger issues and he said that Joseph was struggling with some mystery illness and he strongly believed that Summer was poisoning Joseph. But then he went on to say that he didn't think that's how they died, which is very interesting to hear from him. Joseph's family became extremely enraged from this, which is 100% understandable. Apparently Joseph had been struggling with some sort of illness, but it was not being poisoned by his wife. They did say that Summer was possessive over Joseph, but it was never to any sort of threatening extent. And Joseph's father himself said that he had no doubts in his mind that Summer loved his son. And on November 5th, 2014, shortly after these ridiculous, ridiculous book ideas, Merritt was arrested for the murders of the McStay family. Merritt's DNA had been found in the McStay's vehicle on the steering wheel and on the gear shift. Then upon further investigation, FBI found 27 phone calls sent from Merritt's phone to Joseph's phone on February 4th, the day that they went missing. Cell phone pings from Merritt's phone were also in the same exact location that the graves were dug on February 6th, and tire tracks that were found at the scene matched the tires of Merritt's Chevy truck. He is currently awaiting trial right now and the district attorney is looking for the death penalty. Like I said earlier, according to the arrest warrants, Autopsies on the bodies did in fact show that the deaths were from blunt force trauma and then there was even further findings supporting the fact that they were possibly tortured before they were murdered. It was then found out that Merritt had an extreme gambling problem and pretty much just a problem with money in general. He had written checks equaling over $21,000 taken from Joseph's bank account in the few days after the family was killed. He then proceeded to take that money to casinos all along the California coast and lost thousands upon thousands of dollars. Merritt has also lost majority of his attorneys that he had representing him, and for a while he even said that he was representing himself, which has in turn pushed back this trial multiple, multiple times. I'm pretty sure it was supposed to happen I want to say like around a year ago, he's been arrested and, you know, in custody for two years at this point, um, but he keeps firing all of his attorneys. By February 2016, he had already gone through five. His court-appointed investigator even requested to be taken off of the case for unknown reasons and is now being accused of withholding physical information. Merritt's current attorney has even tried to have a gag order put on this investigator. Not sure why, but there seems to just be a ton of sketchy business going on in that realm. As of now, the trial is set for November 13th, 2017, so just a few days from now, and it has been solidified that this is going to be the day the trial starts. After all, it had been pushed back many, many times. The trial is expected to last for three plus months, and I am hoping that we finally get some justice for this poor family. These two young, innocent boys were murdered. This family, this entire family was brutally murdered by someone and for what? And that leads me to the one question that still remains in this case and that is motive. But to me, that is still pretty obvious if you look into it. According to Joseph's father, Patrick, the meeting that Joseph and Merritt had on the 4th, the day that the family went missing, was not only for this new client, 
but also to confront him about a waterfall that was damaged and not necessarily up to par. Joseph had told his father that Merritt's work was really, really slipping and it was beginning to extremely frustrate him because he had people coming and complaining to him. And he even told his father that he was going to look for a new welder. So maybe he had told Merritt multiple times to get his act together, you know, tighten up his work a little bit. And maybe this was like the straw that broke the camel's back. After all, there were 27 phone calls from Merritt's phone to Joseph that same day. What if this meeting, Joseph fired him? What if that's what this was about? What if he got so frustrated that he fired him on the spot and told him he was getting a new welder? What if the phone calls was Merritt absolutely freaking out about being fired or the potential of being fired? Maybe it was just a threat at the lunch and it drove him crazy because he needed his money, he needed his job. And my guess is that he probably just went over to the Merritt's house, was very infuriated, and one thing led to another, things kept on escalating. And being basically a construction zone from renovations, he had every tool he possibly needed to murder this entire family. Keep in mind, there were 14 days between the day that this family was last seen to when investigators got there. Things could have been cleaned up very, very easily. This man had a ton of time to cover his tracks, essentially. The only thing that I found strange is that the bank account that Merritt put all this money in was actually opened on the 3rd of February. So it was opened a day before the family went missing, which makes me think he already knew what was about to happen. He already knew his work was slipping, that his job was in jeopardy. And I'm thinking it is also possible that all of this was premeditated. So while this pretty much is solved and investigators are pretty positive this man is the one that killed the McStay family and his trial is set to start in a little while. Um, there are still a couple more questions in this case. You guys are always asking me if you can watch trials, if there's things that we can follow together, and I thought this would be the perfect opportunity for that. Make sure if you are liking this solved series, you give me a huge thumbs up. You guys, I was so worried last week. I already said that, I know, but you guys blew me out of the water. I always watch my views when the video first goes up to kind of base how you guys feel on things and my views had doubled from every other video that I have ever done. You guys really showed a lot of love and support on that one. I know the family probably appreciates it and I honestly appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoy that there is something to learn from these videos. So if you love this, give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to check me out on all of my social media platforms that I have listed down below. Hit that subscribe button, become a member of the family. We're about to hit 60,000 subscribers and whoo, that's crazy. You guys, I, I don't even think you understand what you watching these videos is doing for these families. I have finally spoken to a parent of one of the people I have covered and honestly I have made a lifelong best friend with this woman and to hear how much we are helping someone has been amazing and mind-blowing and I just want you guys to know that you all are a part of this just as much as I am making these videos so just wanted to say thank you as I always do and on that note I'm gonna go ahead and go guys see you in my next video bye <laughs>